Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 219, featuring the fourth and final installment of my interview with Mr. Guido Hinkle. In this part of the interview, we talk briefly about the Realms of Arcania series before getting into uh, Guido's time at Interplay and the work that he did on Planescape, Torment, and much, much more. Got a lot of great stuff to cover here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Guido Hinkle. Yeah, I noticed you said that Star Trail was your favorite. Even though uh, the Shadows Over Riva, that was the one that had the CD. You had CD-ROM technology at that point, and the SVGA graphics, and wasn't it also the most successful of, of the three? So, it was. But you know, for me, from my personal perspective, developing Shadows Over Riva wasn't as much fun as Star Trail was. Like I said, in Star Trail, we had the advantage. We just came out of creating a hit. We were very confident at the time because when we developed Blade of Destiny, we did not know what's going to happen. The game was completely self-funded, so we had a lot riding on it. There was a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety that came with it during the development. We really had to make sure we hit our deadlines, otherwise we're just toast because we run out of money. We also didn't know how would the media react to it because this was the first Realms of Arcania games based on a huge license. Will they like it or will they just say, that was a complete disaster, you did not capture the essence of the game? And then ultimately, how would the players react? We had no idea what to expect. So it was really high tension as we developed and published the game. So when we started Star Trail, we had much more confidence. Blade of Destiny was a success. Everybody, or many players liked it. They really loved the concept and were happy with what we did in terms of translating pen and paper game to the computer. Media stood behind us and all that. So, you know, that just gives you a much, much stronger sense of, uh, of accomplishment that you can do it. You don't, you're not afraid anymore. So we went into that and said, okay, we have this thing. Let's see what we can throw out and what we can improve. So we didn't have to build the core technology. We could focus on making it a better experience overall, which is always you know, easier and probably a lot more lighthearted when you do it than grinding out technology from the scratch. And I think that is why, my, in retrospect, my, my bias on the Star Trail is it was just fun to develop. We had a great core team. You know, we had great people to work with. The game turned out exactly the way we wanted to. Again, it was a financial success. It was uh, an, a critical success and all that. So everything fell into place. It was the perfect storm. When we started doing Shadows Over Riva, it got to the point that things became a little repetitive. You started to get the sense of you're burning out, you know, you're exhausted. It's like the same thing again, you know, the same rules again, same game world again, the same engine again. And on top of that, we kind of felt locked down because the whole thing was conceptualized as a trilogy. We knew we have to make three games and you cannot change technology halfway through the trilogy. It would break the whole thing. So we knew we have to stick with what we created. But at the same time, Technology out in the world kept developing at such a pace that we almost looked outdated by the time we were finished. And we knew that, but we couldn't do much about it because if we would have thrown out and rewritten the whole core of the game, the engine, the technology behind it, first of all, it would have taken forever. And second of all, it would have looked completely different than the other games. It would have created a completely different experience, and we couldn't afford to do that. So we had to ride it out no matter what, for better or worse. And all that together was just, you know, not as satisfying as Star Trail was. You know, you had this sense of, I wish I could do something different. You know, I wish I could work in a different world for a change because it's the same spells again, the same limitations in the game world of what you can do, what you cannot do. And for me personally, it was just an experience where I was like, ah, I think it's time to move on, really. Mm -hmm. Which I did, yeah, you know, right. uh, ultimately. Yeah, I was wondering, so I guess that those sort of feelings are what led to you uh, joining Black Isle. Yeah, it's, it, it, it was part of the overall thing, especially because at, after Shadows Over Riva was done, the big question in Attic was, what do we do next? My vote went for, let's build our own universe. Let's do something completely new. Let's make our own game. And my partners in the company they just felt very strongly about continuing to do Realms of Arcania games because there was a fan base. You know there's an established fan base. You know there is a commercial success behind it and you can almost guarantee 
if you make the game, you will sell certain quantities. So, you know, it was sort of the lifeblood of the company at the time. And uh, giving that up naturally is a hard decision. Uh, and for me, it was just the point is like, I cannot do this one more time. You know, I have to do something else. At the same time, I met my wife. And my wife was working for New World Computing at the time. She was working oh. on Heroes of Might and Magic. Uh, so we met at a social occasion and we started developing this relationship. And eventually the question came up, what do we do? Should she move to Germany or should I move to the US? Because somehow we needed to work this out. It was obvious uh, for both of us that she probably wouldn't do so well in Germany because she doesn't speak the language. You know, the culture is just very different and all that. And for me... Being at that juncture in my career, it was much easier to say, you know what, I will move to the U.S. and I will try to continue my career there. It seemed like a reasonable approach, you know, and because I wanted to move on from the realms of Arcania, things, it was the moment that I just picked up the phone and I called Interplay and said, you know, guys, would you be interested? I guess they were. <laughs> <laughs> they were, yeah. A, a bunch of other companies were too. They weren't the only company I were I talked to. You know, I was I was really fielding uh, the industry at the time. But ultimately, Interplay was the company that I felt most comfortable with. Well, when you got to when you got on the scene, was Planescape Torment? I mean, what stage of development was it? Was it in? Was it fleshed out already? Or not at all? Hmm. Not at all. Uh, what I got was uh, an early vision document that Chris Avalon had written. Uh, it was, I would say, maybe 20 pages long, outlining the story and outlining the basic intentions of the game. Uh, and it hooked me right away. You know, it's just this whole concept of a guy who can't die, you know, who wakes up with amnesia and doesn't remember. And as you progress through the game, you realize he has had so many different incarnations and some of them were just so badass that, you know, he, you broke all the bridges, you burnt all the bridges along the way, these sorts of things. It totally, it fascinated me. And I was like, this is a game I would actually like to be associated with this. So it wasn't, it was very early in the development, really. And Interplay was putting together the team at the time. Uh, so I came in, we didn't even have the full team yet. We still started recruiting. Uh, we'll, we're still recruiting people and adding, you know, members to the team. So, what was it like working with Chris Avalon? <sighs> you you should probably ask how was it like working with the entire team? Because the fascinating thing in Planescape was it was a complete team effort, uh, and it also reflected, or it was part of how the whole thing was set up. We had, for example, one room where there were four guys working together. But unlike in, in many other projects at Interplay, those weren't four writers or four artists and all that. It was a totally mixed group. There was a, the lead programmer was in that room. Chris Avalon was in there. Tim Donnelly, the lead artist, was in there. And another artist. So, you know, you have all those different points of view in the same room. So when Chris was designing that, they were just spitballing ideas there. And Chris could, you know, really get the vibe from all the other people who were not writers. So, you know, there was really stuff that was far out that somebody just threw in the mix and he could pick up on. And the same was true with all the other guys. So, you know, it was almost like the party room all the time. Also because Tim Donnelly always had candy in there. So everybody always <laughs> came to the room to get candy and all. So there was this constant flow of ideas and information that happened, and that just amalgamated and built this momentum for the game. And Chris and Colin just did a tremendous job tapping into that and then, you know, spinning it and making this huge story of the unnamed one, uh, the nameless one. What do you think about the rule set and the, the engine? Did you Were there moments when you thought, oh, the realms of Arcania did this part so much better? Uh, it was it was very different, naturally, you know, because it wasn't as hardcore as what we did in the Realms of Arcania series. And in many ways, I appreciated that. I was looking forward to that because the Realms of Arcania was almost restricting itself. It was limiting itself to a certain audience. And with Planescape, I felt we have the potential to break out of that, create a game that has much more appeal to, I, I don't want to say mainstream, but to 
other role players who may not necessarily be the guys who really dig all the minutia. Uh, so it was welcome to really limit the, the stats, to limit the, the depth of the game itself, while still keeping enough in it to make sure it's a true role-playing game and not just a facade. Did you work on Fallout 2? <clears throat> I did, very, but you know, my contributions were minimal to that. I was just doing some scripting for it, and that was because of the time pressure, you know. The, the game had a ship date, and in order to make it, uh, work needed to be done. So at Black Isle, the question came up, it's like, who can we throw at this? And, uh, you know, like other people, I gladly volunteered, and I said, okay, you know, I'll be happy to spend two or three weeks scripting stuff for Fallout. And that's what happened. But from a creative standpoint, you know, I had absolutely nothing to do with it. Is that true as well of uh, Neverwinter Nights? Neverwinter Nights was a project that uh, Interplay wanted me to produce in-house because they were working with BioWare, obviously, to do it up in Canada, but they needed a producer in-house who keeps things flowing, who also created the liaison to, to BioWare at the time, who keeps the information flowing between different departments at Interplay and, and the communication between Interplay and BioWare and all that. So I joined that group uh, and I've been in a couple of early meetings, pre-production meetings, where the basic concept of the game was, uh, was chiseled out. Uh, and I was working very closely with Trend at the, at the time, you know, because Trend was a producer at BioWare. And we had a whole bunch of meetings up in Edmonton where we discussed how are we going to do this, this whole sandbox system that they wanted to develop. I had to really look at it from the standpoint of the publisher and say, you know, how are you, excuse me, how are you going to do that without breaking the bank? How are you going to do that in order to make sure it works, you know, across all different scenarios, across all different possible things that might happen and that people might want to do with it. So those were, to a large degree, technical meetings almost, not so much creative as well. Uh, the only other thing I was involved in was looking at artwork because they had a pre-production art team working on it. Uh, and I got to see a lot of the pre-production art they created and they asked my opinion. But that was really all there was to it. All right, you know, I got two, I got two last questions. <laughs> I hope you're not too tired. No, not at all. You know, it's fun. Okay. Uh, so the first one is, you know, you posted the interview up on the site, so I had a lot of fun reading that. But one of the things you said in there was that this was, you know, the article was, or the interview was done in 1999. Uh, so you said in there that online RPGs were just a novelty. They were going to wear off with time. So I'm wondering, you know, what made you think that? And then what are your thoughts about these online RPGs now? I said that. <laughs> I guess that was before World of Warcraft came out. Must have been yeah, you know. Yeah. Well, the thing is, you know, it, that notion comes out of the fact that I am coming out of the generation where platforms evolve so so rapidly, and games became obsolete so quickly. You know, uh, when you were working on the Apple II, once the Apple II was no more, there was really no way to keep those games alive back then. When you made a game for the Commodore 64, by the time the Commodore 64 was faded out, the game was lost, you know, it went into oblivion. Many people may have heard about it, but who was out there who ever played it? You know, it was one of those things. Game died, literally. They had an expiration date. And that is where that notion came from when I made that comment. Uh, a lot has changed, of course, you know. We have emulators today that allow us to really play those old games, even on modern-day computers. And with the Internet, you know, you have access to a lot of that stuff. Uh, you have sites like good old games, you know, that really makes these things available. And it's great, you know, you can really dig in there and play your classic favorite. And in uh, and, and that much, you know, that has changed a lot. So I do no longer think that games are or my games or anybody else's games are novelties really they are not the, the same kind of uh this uh 
time-limited item that they used to be. We have much more longevity. And then if you take a look at the MMOs, you know, how long they've been running, stuff like EverQuest, you know, I can't believe people are still playing EverQuest after all these years. But there's a community out there and the game is still going strong and building and all that, or World of Warcraft and all that. There's a lot more continuity and longevity to it these days, yeah. And also, you know, the the platform itself hasn't evolved that much. I mean, yes, you have the migration from, let's say, Windows XP to, to 2000 and to Vista and all that, and Windows 7, Windows 8 and all that. But they are still compatible enough for the most part that games developed for one platform, you know, 10 years ago are still playable without much work today. And they some of them still look very, very playable and very gorgeous. It's not like the technology and the graphics and all that have outdated all that much. Compared to back in the days, you know, those were huge, giant leaps. You, was, you were working on one of these MMO RPGs for a while, right? The An MMO, yes. Yeah, Squaresoft was, uh, project? Or yes, exactly. That was a project we did for Squaresoft. It was, funny enough, it was a superhero-themed game that we did back then. Uh, and it was with a group of people that came out of the EverQuest team. They had, after EverQuest was launched, they left Ever Sony and EverQuest and wanted to start up their own company. So they approached me because they're local here they're from the area. And they approached me and asked me if I would like to become part of it. And after a couple of meetings that we had and conversations just to make sure we're on the same wavelength and all that, I agreed. I said, okay, I'm going to join this project. And the company was called Amusement. Uh, so we started shopping around concepts for MMOs that we felt were very different than what EverQuest did because we knew everybody's trying to, or is going to try to copy EverQuest because of its huge success, you know. So we said, if we do this, we want to go in a very different direction to make sure we create a game that is unique and finds its own place as opposed to being a Me Too game. So we started pitching it to various publishers and we found that some of most many of them were reluctant just because of the price tag attached to it. Uh, MMOs were very expensive, still are very expensive to develop, and most publishers were just not prepared to spend that kind of money at that time. And eventually we ended up talking to Squaresoft. It was one of those things where you go like, you know, who else is there? And Squaresoft is in LA, so we said, let's drive up to LA, talk to them, see what they have to say. Squaresoft looked at the concept, and like I said, it was a superhero concept called uh, Heroes versus Villains. And they looked at the concept, and immediately you could feel it was like something snapped. And they were like, this is cool, this is really good, because it works from what they can see, and it is so different from Final Fantasy that it would not compete with what they were doing, because they were building Final Fantasy Online at the same time. So... They, the guys from, from L.A. said to us, we love the idea and all that. We have to go back to Tokyo and get approval for this, see what they have to say. So they flew us out to Tokyo to meet with the guys in headquarters. And uh, uh, we had this presentation where we talked to, to them and pitched the product and all. And it got green-lighted. And interestingly enough, especially for Japanese companies, it got instantly in green-lit. We went into the meeting, made the pitch. They asked us to leave the room so we could talk. Half an hour later, they called us back in and said, okay, we're in, we're doing this. And that is almost unheard of with Japanese companies because they usually need time to evaluate and reevaluate things and make sure the whole thing falls into place. So we had a green light, we had a budget, and we had our first check in the bank. So we were started developing the game. And that was before League uh, Justice, you know, what was the, the other game? Uh, not League of Legends. Was it League of Legends? Uh, there was this other uh, uh, superhero MMO. What is it? City of Heroes? Or? City of Heroes, yeah. exactly. That was before City of Heroes was announced or anything. So we did not copy the concept. So we started developing this concept of, a, of an MMO where you play a superhero and you can pick sides. You can play a hero or you could play a villain and it's almost, you know, you against the world. And it was a great concept. It would have been a blast. Unfortunately, it was also the same time that Squaresoft made the Final Fantasy movie, the first one. And they sank so much money into it that it almost break the, broke the bank for them. And uh, they had to restructure the company 
and unfortunately one of the decisions that was made at the time was to cut all external development. So on one fateful day we got the phone call from Tokyo that said, you know, guys, we're sorry, but all external development has been cancelled. We're still paying your, uh, your next milestone, but that is it. Uh, they were gracious enough, though, to help us shop the project around to other publishers. But again, it failed and stumbled on the same problem we had before, that the price tag was so big that every publisher said, I'm sorry, we can't do that. And, uh, you know, interestingly enough, just because of work, in terms of work ethics, what really impressed me at the time was that Squaresoft, they did not only help us find publishers, they actually went into those meetings with us to speak up on our behalf, to say, you know, we love the project, we love those guys, we just can't do the project, we think it would be perfect for you. So they really went out of their way to help us find new publishers. But, you know, knowing Square, who they are, and what kind of budgets they're working with, it's intimidating stuff, you know. We're talking budgets that no American publisher had dealt with before, you know, and everybody looked at us and said, you know, guys, it's a great idea, but it's out of our league. It's nothing we can do, sorry. So, the, unfortunately, the whole thing collapsed and the company filed, you know, closed shop. All right, so here's my uh, last question here. So, I, I noticed that you evaluate game design classes, and you know, I thought this was kind of interesting. Uh, a lot of the developers I've had on the show, they like to point out, well, when I was learning this stuff, there were no classes, and you know, I kind of wondered how valuable are the classes. Uh, yeah. And you know, just sort of when you're evaluating these things, what do you what do you look for, and, and have you noticed strengths and weaknesses? You know, it's it's a really funny concept, actually, the way it works. Uh, it's done by the Art Institute of California, and I know one of the teachers there very well. Uh, and he approached me at one point and said, you know, I'm having these game design classes, and I think what would really help those guys is to talk to people who really work in the industry, to talk to people who who they look up to, to people who have all this experience and, you know, can really help them, give them valuable feedback. So what he did was he set up, uh, as part of the curriculum, each, he set them up as teams of three or four people, and they actually had to create a product pitch. So they had to give, design a vision document, a design document. They had to sort of create an early prototype, which they usually did in Macromedia, Flash, and stuff like that. And then have to go in in front of us, and, and the teacher invited a, a couple of guys from the games industry. It was not only me, it was a bunch of other people as well, uh, mostly interplay folks, most interestingly. So they had to pitch us. We were the publishers. We were playing the part of the publishers. So they had to pitch us and convince us that their game is the one we should put our money into. And they would do this. They had the presentations. They had the video, the music, the whole spiel, everything. You know. And we would sit there and listen to it. And we would give them feedback afterwards. And we would evaluate and say, you know, I think this is a really intriguing product. Uh, but... And then you would start pointing out shortcomings that they had. For example, if the presentation wasn't round, some of them, you know, you know, have problems speaking in public in front of people. So that, you know, if you have a product pitch and you go into a boardroom in front of a board of directors, you have to really convince them. You can't start to fall apart in front of these people. So it's an, an important skill. Uh, the same thing, was the pitch complete? Was there all the information that you need to know as a publisher how, you, you know, to make a wise decision? All these things we evaluated, we graded, and gave them feedback. And afterwards, when it was all said and done, they actually had the chance to sit down with us and just chat, just talk, you know, get stories, anecdotes, and pick your brain. It's like, how did you do that, or how would you do that? Just to get a feel and a vibe for what it means to be in the games industry. And I hope it is helpful to them, you know. It's, it's always been fun to do, but uh, ultimately it is just my way of giving back a little, because like you said, uh, in the old days, there was no such thing. You know, when I started programming like you, there was nothing. The best you could pick up as a, in terms of a book was a ROM listing of the Apple II. You know, that was really a print out of the entire ROM in, in mnemonics, in assembly code and all that. That was as what it meant to have literature on programming. There was nobody there who could teach you that kind of stuff. And I would have been very help, very grateful and thankful if there would have been people or outlets where you could really just 
get information and ask somebody. I remember when I was working in assembly on the V20 the first time, I had this graphics routine where I had to loop and I had a certain problem. I did not know how to solve this problem. Everything I tried worked and was cumbersome, but it did not. It wasn't. It was never fast enough. It was only until a friend's brother who studied information technology at the time, came home from college and all that. And I was at his home, at his house at the time, and I had the chance to sit down to, with him and I asked him, how would you do that? And he said, oh, it's an easy one. All you do is this and you check the carry flag and bam, there you have it. I was like, oh my God, that is so simple. Why didn't I think of that? But, you know, sometimes you just need that kind of feedback. And that was like a 30-second conversation and it made all the difference in my world. And I just think, by giving feedback to other developers, other game developers, and people who want to work in the industry, it's just my way of giving it back. All right, thank you. Well, there's one other question I have to ask. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've been looking at the guitar the whole time, and I know you do oh. some some heavy metal guitar work. So, yes. you know, have you, are you in? Have you been in bands or? Are there I used yes, YouTube I videos used to, or what? I mean, how can people? No. I used to play in bands, yes, but that's a long time ago. That was during the 80s, hair metal era. And, <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I was mostly, uh, I was a strong Dokken follower. I, you know, Dokken, Queensryche was one of the bands I always loved, and Van Halen, you know, those were my idols, the real guitar gods, really, that I was aspiring to. And I was playing for many years in bands, yes. We were... You know, maybe we were local bands, nothing really big. But I, I have to say, you know, we had some opening gigs with, with larger acts. So I was opening for bands like Uriah Heep. I was opening for uh, Lee Aaron and a whole bunch of other bands, you know. But it was all usually in local venues, not so much that we toured with them. But, you know, if they were in the area, we would get three or four venues that were close by that we had the chance to join them and open for them. What was the name of your band? Uh, one of them was Stormbringer. And the other one was called Breathless. And, you know, unfortunately, we never really got a record deal. We got one. We signed one record contract that we had to pay out of pocket and got screwed, of course, you know, like everybody did in those days. <laughs> you know, you had the guy in the basement with a little recording studio. We, we, we did all the cuts and eventually they never, the, the, the record never materialized. Let's put it that way, you know, but the money was gone. It's like, okay, so let's just shut this down as studio experience and it helped because in the future you know you get more comfortable in the studio and all but music wise in general i don't know if you're aware of that i did the music for some of the games that i did also for example star trail and shadows of Ariva, where i uh wrote and recorded the music for any particular song or score that you're particularly proud of um I like them all, even though, you know, when I listen to them now, uh, they are very dated. I mean, digital technology in those days were was very limited, and we didn't have the budget to go the orchestra route that most, you know, musicians go these days, because it was just not an option back in that day. So it was all MIDI-based, you know, with, with synthesizers and all that. And you can tell, you know, you listen to it, and it's like, ah, you know, it just doesn't have the kind of expression and the kind of quality that you would get otherwise. But it was a lot of fun, and I love the soundtrack I did for Shadows Over Riva. There are really bits and pieces in there that I'm kind of proud of because they really dig deep into the core of, of film scoring, which I was studying at the time very intensively. You know, I would analyze certain scores. I would go into the stuff that Jerry Goldsmith did. I went into the stuff that people like Danny Elfman and John Williams did to see how they orchestrate, how they arrange certain parts for orchestra, just to learn the whole thing because again it's one of those things I'm completely self-taught and I never had real theory music theory classes or anything I, I know the stuff I understand the stuff but when I first started orchestrating I had no idea you know I was just going by my gut feelings like what sounds right until I had a first transcription of uh, Schindler's List it was where I looked at some of the horn sections and the string sections and I was like you know, this is interesting how he layers that stuff just because uh, I had never thought of it doing it that way. And once I tried it, all of a sudden it gave it that breadth and all that, that I've always been looking for and could not find. And the same with horns, because horns in particular are very hard to arrange 
to make sure you you don't have holes in the in the sonic spectrum. Uh, so you know it's it's an art to do that and. I had not learned that art. I was just really trying it and studying those tracks, those scores, and all that helped me a lot to really understand what is going on. And I think in the end, it made the the shadows over Riva track a lot better than what I did on Star Trail. And I'm a lot more daring too because I wasn't afraid to do things where before I was like, "You can't do that," you know, this is too dissonant. And in, in Shadows Over Riva, there were passages where I deliberately went for that feel. I, you know, I just set the strings against each other, so it was really shrill and all this, like because that is exactly what I want. And that was cool. So are you doing some music for Deathfire? Um, well, I did the music for the video, you know, for okay. the, the Kickstarter pitch. Uh, I would love to do the music for Deathfire. I'm not sure if it's realistic because of the timeline we have, because writing the music takes a lot of my time. Uh, if I would do it, I would probably work with an arranger this time, that I do the composition and all that and write the music pieces, but I would probably work with somebody else to really arrange the thing in the end and record and engineer the whole thing so that it's my music, but I don't have to deal with all the minutia of you know, getting it to the final stage. Because I think also, today with today's technology and all that and production values, I would not be the right guy to do that because it takes certain skill sets that again, I do not have. And there are people out there who made it their craft to really learn the craft, to learn the, the art and all that. And yeah. they're much better at this. So why should I do that? Yeah, so you got that. Okay, this is the absolute last question. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, but the Planescape Torment box back there, I've heard that your face is actually the model for that box. Yeah, here is in that, case. Is that you true? Can see that is true, yeah, that is me. Here, take a look. Um, <laughs> How did that come about? <laughs> you know, that was pure coincidence. It was not really uh, deliberate. What happened was we had... Uh, we had the marketing guys at Interplay who thought about the packaging and all that. And there was a basic design laid out how we could do that. And we hired an, uh, an ad agency to come up with design suggestions to put them in front of us to see what we would sh should do for the packaging. So the agency came up with this one design that the whole team that we all pretty much liked, which was this concept with the blue guy face in the front and the orange background. And we, we decided we go this route. And we had a model booked for that, for the photo shoot. So everything was go. The day before the shoot, the phone rang and the model said, sorry, I have another engagement that pays better or who knows what, I don't even remember what it was. I can make it to your photo shoot. The problem was that everything was booked. We booked uh, a studio in Burbank, uh, the, the Tom Berman Studios, which uh, Tom Berman is a famous makeup artist for movies. He did the makeup for Planet of the Apes and countless other special effects movies. So this is not somebody you just give a call and say, hey, can we come in real quick? You have to book that in advance and you have to pay them, you know. These are expensive people. So uh, we were faced with a dilemma. We had everything booked, photographer, location, people, everything, and no model. So what are we going to do? We had this emergency meeting in the office. I was like, what are we going to do? So as we were talking and thinking about other people we could hire, and if there is even a way of hiring another model, the guy from the agency looked at me weird, and all of a sudden he goes like, you know, Guido, you have that bone structure going and all that. Would you be the model? And I was very reluctant to do it, I have to admit. I did not want to do it, really. It was only when five people in the room suddenly started looking at me and was like, Oh yeah, you know. It's like, do we really? It's like I. It felt wrong to me. Perfectly honest, it felt wrong to me, and it also felt wrong to me because I knew that uh, for the other team members, you know, it is one of those things where you have to be very careful because uh, you don't want to create the impression that I want to be the center of attention. I was the producer of the game, but I did not want people to completely uh, associate me with that game because that would not be right, that would not be true because there's a whole team working behind it. So I was very, very reluctant to really do that. But given the situation, I agreed and we said, okay, that, do that. So the next morning, 8 o'clock, I find myself in Burbank in a makeup chair with Tom Berman starting to glue latex on my face. 
and she had all those bits and pieces and he started gluing it on and uh, I kept watching in the mirror and I was like, this is bizarre, this is totally weird. And when he was finished, you know, you look at yourself and it's like, oh my God, <laughs> you know, this is not me. But at the same time, it moves like yourself and it, when you talk, your face moves and your lips move. It's like, it is me, but it's not me. You know, it's it's a, it's a it's a really weird yeah. experience. Kind of felt like paint- the nameless one, I guess. Yeah, point. and he started painting the whole thing. You know, this was was a, an amazing experience, really. And so we put the wig on and everything, and which I thought was kind of hokey. But hey, everybody told me once it's you know photographed and touched up, it's gonna work. You know, it's like okay, fair enough. So we did the photo shoot, and I just sat there, looked in the camera, and we took about a hundred pictures, and I still have all of them, you know, uh, took a whole slew of pictures and eventually took the whole thing back off. And that was probably the, also a memorable part because afterwards, after they put the solvent on to take all that glue up, my whole face was red for the entire day. I would look like Mr. Krabs, you know, like a lobster is like, <laughs> bruh, totally red. So, but it was a truly memorable experience. Also, because I got to see Tom Berman's studio, his workshop, and he has all those props in there from the movies he was working on, and just to walk through there and see these things, it's like amazing, you know, these guys are just awesome. I couldn't even imagine, you know, doing stuff like that, because he, they even sculpt, you know, people like Tom, they sculpt the maquettes and all, they make those faces, and then they create the latex appliances for it and all that. They do this all themselves, and it's all artisanship you know this is this is a skill that they've done all their lives and to see that like that is it's all inspiring for me really does it kind of freak you out to see your face on all those boxes for yeah it is you know <laughs> it's like oh well you know there yeah. there are really moments where i wish people would not pay attention to it so much but you know it is what it is i didn't even know about it till i started researching for this interview oh really so. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time. Yeah, absolutely. It was fun. I left it. Oh, definitely. And that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back next week with a, a new retrospective, and I'll probably be looking at Wizardry 8. So if you got some fun stories about that game, please share them. As always, I want to thank you very, very much if you have helped support this show. Uh, don't ask for much, guys. If you like these uh, shows, throw a few dollars into the old bard's hat, or the drinking horn, as it were. Uh, you can do that over at matchhat.us. Just look for the support the show link in the menu. Really, really, really appreciate that, guys. I do have some bad news. If you haven't heard already, uh, Guido's Kickstarter for Deathfire has failed. On a more positive note, though, he is trying to raise the money. He's got a plan B, uh, which involves just going directly uh, to the website and paying in through PayPal. So... I uh, wish him very, uh, a, lot, a lot of luck with that, and I'll post a link to it in the show notes. All right, so let's wrap this up with a, a quotation. I was trying to find something uh, kind of uplifting after this uh, Kickstarter uh, failure, and I found this uh, quotation from Calvin Coolidge. I think you'll like this. Nothing in this world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. See you guys next week. Miss, uh, what's the old 96er? Oh, that's our world-famous Paul Bunyan's Blue Ox Steak. It is a 96-ounce prime-aged beef steak. And if you or any member of your party orders the old 96er and finishes, everybody eats for free. <laughs> ah. <laughs>